Good morning, family. We are going to jump right in. Come on, it's a celebration day, amen? 21 days of prayer and fasting are over. Everybody's going to run to Teddy's. Run into Moana. Get them. Wow. Well, hey, I hope that your experience in, in this season with us has been uh, encouraging. I actually hope it's been challenging as well. Any time that we as a community just decide, hey, this, for, for 21 days, what we want to do is we want to try and intentionally focus our heart, our life, the rhythm of what we do daily. We want to bring, we want to step that up in more intentionality towards Jesus. Do you know that that is a good Good thing, amen. So I hope, I hope even with the, in your families, I hope that it changed your rhythm of the evening. I know in my house we were able to pray and, and worship with our kids just a little bit more consistently. We were able to do those things and it was really great. And, and man, how many of you here were, were here for our prayer and worship night last night? Come on, man, that was so powerful. Can we just say thank you to Ross and the team? Ross, Nick, uh, Kim, can we just say thank you so much? Uh, and our tech team? Thank you so much. I mean, that was, we got, we just got to worship and pray and, and it was just so, so much fun. Um, and so I want you to know every six months we do this as a church. Every six months we're going to pray and we're going to fast again. So pay attention to like in August, we're going to probably start looking at that early August. So we get in a rhythm of remembering uh, just to depend on Jesus. Amen. All right, all right. Okay, someone look to your neighbor and say wholehearted. wholehearted. Now look to your other neighbor and say wholehearted. 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 Okay, so, so here's the question this morning. The question, it's a big question. It's an important question. It may be a weird question, but it is a question nonetheless. Are we wholehearted or are we wholehearted? Are we whole, W-H-O-L-E, completely uh, surrendered to Jesus, wholehearted in love with God, or are we wholehearted? Meaning, are there areas of our hearts that we've reserved for us, but not Him? Are there areas of our life uh, where we're like, Jesus, you can go in that room, you can go in this place, you can go there, but you cannot go here or here, that is off limits. That's called being wholehearted. It's when we have the wholeness and what God actually wants for us is abundant life. Jesus said that I have come that you would know life and that you would know what? Abundantly, yeah? Abundant life. You would know whole and complete life. It doesn't mean that life is perfect. It doesn't mean that every single person's a millionaire. What it means is we have wholeness and completeness in Jesus. We couldn't get it any other place. But when we elevate things above God, when we surrender uh, certain parts of our life but not other parts, I wonder, are we being more wholehearted than wholehearted? This is a really, really important question. In fact, Moses uh, essentially challenged the people of Israel with this in Deuteronomy chapter 6. You can open up in your notes, open up in your Bible, but in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it's this. He says, listen, O Israel. He says, hey, hey, listen up. For the Lord your God is our God. He is one. And basically he's saying Yahweh, Yahweh is alone. He is God. He is the only one. He's the only one that's ever been. He is God. And you must love the Lord. Someone say, love the Lord. Love the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly. Now you got to say it again, wholeheartedly. Say it. To these commands that I'm giving you today, repeat them. Talk about them to your kids. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up, when you're driving down the road, when you're walking your dog, whatever we're doing, let's talk about it. This is important. See, God's people at this point were about to step into incredible blessing. They were about to step into a whole world that they had not experienced in, a, in quite a long time. They had been slaves for hundreds of years. How many of you know that slave people live different than free people? And so for 100, 400 years plus, they're in, and now they're being corrected. You know, they disobeyed God, so now they're stuck in the wilderness, and they're wandering around there for 40 years. Anybody ever felt you've been wandering in some wilderness? Well, here now God is saying, you're about to step into everything I actually want for your life, 
But I want you to know the only way you're going to be able to navigate it is if you do it wholeheartedly. You're about to step into blessings you've never experienced. You're about to, to take lands that you didn't, that, that, that didn't belong to you. You're about to actually inherit houses that you didn't build. You're about to get a bunch of blessing, but if you don't do it wholeheartedly, then you are, your blessings are about to become your burdens. And later in that scripture, he'll talk about that. He'll talk about how you got to be careful because you're going to inherit these things, but you're going to be, you got to watch out for the distractions. Are we wholehearted? Or are we wholehearted? In fact, if you have your notes this morning, I want you to actually draw a picture of a heart. Just draw a picture of a heart. As a, just a, we're going to actually continue that. Draw that picture of the heart. So I actually want to stop and I want to pray right now that the Lord would continue to, to just move in, in our midst. Father, we pray right now for wholehearted devotion to you. Wholehearted devotion. In Jesus' name, amen. At night, I read uh, stories to my kids. Sometimes I do weird voices, and they, they still think that's funny. They probably won't when they're teenagers, but we'll see, you know. And this is one that they really, really like. It, it, it's called Halfway, Herbert. Herbert was seven and a half years old, three and a half feet tall, 55 and a half pounds, and everyone called him Halfway Herbert. But it wasn't because his dog was a half poodle or a half bulldog. It was because Herbert did everything halfway. Herbert never put his whole heart into anything. He never really tried. Something was missing in Herbert's heart. When he brushed his teeth, he only brushed the top parts. He didn't brush the bottom. He spent a lot of time at the dentist. When he was at school, he only did half his homework, and so he only answered half the questions, and he only learned half of what he was supposed to know. So you know he's failing. He never finished his meals. He only finished half of them. He only slept halfway through the night, so he was hungry, and he was tired all the time. Even when he played soccer with his friends, he only listened to half of what the coach was telling him. He would have had so much more fun if he had played with his whole heart, and his team would have been happier too. One day, he got in trouble because that halfway Herbert sort of life, when he got in trouble and he told a half-truth. He told a half-truth and he had to have a conversation with his dad because a half-truth is still a whole lie. My kids like that book because, because it just illustrates that point that when we come to Jesus, we don't do it halfway. We've got to do it whole. But I tell you, the problem sometimes is simply that there's so many options for us that our focus is distracted, isn't it? When we live in a place with so much resources, so many things, don't we often feel like, wait, I, only have to choose, I can only have a couple options? How come I can't have all of the options? It feels like it's okay to be fully committed to some things while not committed to others. You can be fully and crazily committed to your football team. Woo! Someone in here has painted their chest at one point for your team. Maybe not. But when you, when you bring that level of devotion, excitement, and passion to your faith, oh, you're a nut, boy. Lord, you're crazy. You're one of them Jesus freaks, aren't you? Did I just stand right next to you at the UH game when you were screaming at the top of your lungs at the ref? Oh, but that's not crazy. This is crazy. You know, in our culture right now, here's, we get more rewarded for wholehearted devotion to our workplace more than wholehearted devotion in our marriages. We know it's true. It's because you don't get a raise for focusing on your marriage, do you? You don't get a productivity bonus for keeping that date night every week, do you? At work, you get, man, the more you do, and we celebrate it. We're like, man, this guy's a hard worker. First in, last out. Home life is a wreck, but at work, the guy's a champion. We're winning at work, and we're losing at home. Those are real. And, 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 and in Jesus' worldview, they're not separate. Sometimes we've compartmentalized our lives. As long as I'm doing good here, I don't really have to worry about here. I don't know, but the whole abundant life in Christ means that every part of our life is at the table with Jesus. Sometimes we just don't like having our options limited. <laughs> we just don't like it. Don't tell me what I cannot have. 
I'm an American. You know, like I can get what I want. Can you imagine? Here's, some, here's an example of some terrible vows. I remember when I, uh, when I was uh, pledging my love and my devotion to my wife. Tell her, I love you so much. You're such a blessing. You're the only woman that I'm taller than. Wasn't the main reason, it was one, I'm just saying. But can you imagine that moment where I said, babe, I love you, but don't expect a whole lot of conversation. I want to be with you, and I will do my duty. I'll provide, I'll fight for you, but don't expect any kind of major intimacy moments. I'm going to need you to bless me, I'm going to need you to encourage me. I'm going to need you. I'm going to need some intimacy sometimes. But don't expect a whole lot of me laying my life down for you. Come on, those are terrible vows. But I think when it comes to Jesus, sometimes inadvertently that's what we're doing. We're saying, God, I want to be with you. But man, conversation, I, I want to be with you. But time in the word, I mean, uh, Netflix just opened up that new season. <laughs> this is why our, our moments of prayer and fasting are so important because it reminds us that our rhythms are not dictated by our comfort but by our commitment to Christ. How I posture my heart determines my proximity to His heart. The direction, am I leaning into Him or am I leaning away? Is my heart soft or is it hardened towards Him? And a, and, and a, a thousand plus years later, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Jesus repeats these words. It means that these words were so important. Love the Lord your God wholeheartedly. Somebody say wholeheartedly. Every part of your life. In fact, there was a scribe, a, a lawyer, in fact, that asked Jesus, what do I need to do to get into heaven? And Jesus, classic, he just says this, well, let me answer your question with a question. You ever try to answer a question with a question? Isn't that annoying? Jesus can do what he wants. He says, what, so what does the scripture say? What's written in the law? And the guy says, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind. And you must love your neighbor as yourself. I picture this man in this moment really proud of himself. He's a scribe. He's a lawyer. He knows the deal. Jesus just asked a question, and he's like, well, what does it say? Well, I'm going to tell you what it said. Love God with everything you have. A little bit of emphasis. And love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus even high fives him, basically. He says, right answer. Come on, that's always a good thing. When you have Jesus himself saying, good answer, that's awesome. The man should have walked away at this point, but he couldn't help himself. He just couldn't help himself. He says this, it says, but the man desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, well, who's my neighbor? Oh, bro, you should have stopped while you were ahead. You should have just stopped right there. Oh, but he couldn't help it. Here's the first two things in your notes I want you to write down, and it's this. Give him my emotions. First, give him, give him my emotions. Second, give him my motives. Now, if you were to look at the original Hebrew language for heart, mind, soul, strength, and you were to look at the Greek words for heart, mind, soul, strength, you would find that there are very similar themes within those words. And in fact, so things like heart and soul, very similar as the seat of our emotions. In other cultures, we, say, we, we use words like, man, what's in your heart to mean like what's going on inside and to make those decisions, right? In other cultures, it's the liver, Hey, man, how's your liver today? <laughs> that, I mean, that in, in, in other cultures interpret some of these things in different ways. And there's a culture, and I believe it's in Africa, and the language of the heart is the same, but it's the language of the liver. So heart and soul. So some of these are interchangeable to some degree. So for that being said, as you draw that heart, I want you to divide it into four quadrants if you have your notes. Draw the heart, four quadrants, put emotions, and put motives. Because it's so funny, this man couldn't help but expose his motives. And he couldn't help but expose his emotions. 
The emotion of needing affirmation. The motive of needing to be right. Not only that, it shows you the level of emotional brokenness that this man is dealing with when instead of actually wanting to learn from Jesus, he intentionally steps into this conversation in order to shame and embarrass Jesus. When you and I are living in a way that requires me to put you down in order so that I feel good, that is a problem. I am emotionally broken, and you cannot be spiritually mature and emotionally immature. It's not congruent with Jesus. And so this is what's happening right here in this scripture. Jesus is telling him a couple thousand year old reality, but he can't help himself. And this goes into the whole story about the good Samaritan. It exposes the heart. Can you just know that Jesus already knows your heart? And that's the problem. (laughs) Because he knows the true condition of our heart and the motives behind every thought and every single action. And so the world says, follow your heart. That's dangerous. The Bible says that the heart of man is deceitfully wicked, meaning we're fickle. We are so fickle. Like, today I love this, and then next week I'm like, ah. God says, don't be led by the heart. Be led by the Spirit of God. Be anchored in truth. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul. The motives. I need to surrender my will to Jesus even. Oh, but that is so much of a higher cost than just doing a bunch of things that I'm supposed to do. It means I actually have to dig deep into the the Hebrew word for the soul is in the inner man, like the inner self, the places you cannot see. In that place, I have to somehow let just open it up, let Jesus get in there. I have to surrender it to him. Another guy, Sadducee, another lawyer. Lawyer's not getting a great rap in the New Testament. If you're a lawyer, I love you. Jesus loves you too. These guys were just off. Don't worry about it. He says, when the Pharisees heard that they silenced the Sadducees, Jesus is in this another moment. And again, loving the Lord with all your heart. That's where we're going with this. He says, this is what he says. He's like, hey man, uh, you got to love the Lord with all your heart. One of them says, an expert in religious law tried to trap him. Motives of the heart exposed once again. And so the Sadducees didn't have a great experience. They were shut down. Now the Pharisees, they're thinking, ah, man, we're better than the Sadducees. So now we're going to test Jesus. Now we're going to step into this moment where we're going to test this prophet, this teacher, this man. He says, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus replies, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all of the demands of all the prophets are based on these two commandments. And that is such a monumental statement because what it means is that for thousands of years, the people of God have been following a specific set of 600 plus laws according to Mosaic law. They've had to do all of these things. In fact, they believe if they could just be perfect, if they could just have it all together, even just for a day, that the Messiah would actually come quicker. Jesus says it this way, every single one of those laws that you've been following is summed up in two, loving God with every part of who you are, and then loving your neighbor out of the overflow of that, loving people the way that you love yourself. In your notes, I want you to write this, give him my thoughts and give him my actions. Give him my thoughts and my actions. Jesus knows the thoughts of our mind, and we focused on that the last two weeks in Romans chapter 12. Therefore, offer yourselves. I implore you. I beg you. I'm asking. Offer yourself like a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your worship to him. Don't be conformed to the world out there, but be transformed. Someone say transformed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. we got to change our thinking so that it, in, it changes our behavior. Uh, I had a mentor, many of you know him, Pastor Wayne. He says that we, you, we rarely rise above the quality of our thinking. I thought, man, I wish I could say stuff like that. <laughs> With everything, but not only that, not only knowing more, 
but actually living more. So if you, heart, mind, so, so the mind right there. So our thoughts, that we would surrender every thought captive to Jesus. Now, when we're in a culture that is bombarding all of our thoughts hundreds of thousands of times a day with messages and advertisements and agendas and things and truth statements and all of these things, it is so challenging to push back all of that static so that our minds can actually be focused on Jesus but we have to surrender our minds. This is why what we consume is so incredibly important. This is why our thought life has to be laid bare. This is why, family, this is why uh, things like our digital access to pornography on the internet, it's just, look, I, I'm, I don't want to be provocative. I'm not trying to just stir things up. But the level of accessibility given to men and women globally, children globally, right there on that screen to the entire planet with no filter whatsoever, we have to give our thoughts to him because they're affecting our behavior and they are robbing us of the beauty of what true humanity is the beauty of the differences in our genders the beauty of the differences in our expression of our worship our lives even our very sexuality like rising above the way that we think we got to give it all there's not one area that god is like you can have that that i'm not really interested in that give him our thoughts amen and then this it says give him our actions our strength Because Jesus knows it's not just what you know, it's what you do with what you know. It's what you do with what you know. We learn truth so much faster than we apply truth. And then we get, we have so much resource. And it's almost like this. It's the ratio is almost like this, where when you first get saved, I had a mentor kind of put it this way, where when you first get saved, it's like you, you, you get saved and you know this much about God. You know, this much right here, it's like all of it, you're like blown away, God loves me, I can't believe that, like I had sin in my life and he wants to rescue me from that sin, so I'm right before him, now I get to learn and grow. This is what we know about God, and what we know sort of matches what we do. It's about the same in the beginning, you get all fired up, what I know, and the ratio is like one to one, and then what I do, what am I doing with it? So I'm going to start doing my devotions. I'm going to start uh, changing, like God's going to start changing the way that I speak, the way that I think. I'm going to change. This is what happens over time, is that the, the more that we know, it increases more and more and more. Digital world, digital things. There's another YouTube thing. Here's another online study. Right now, media, 10,000 Bible resources. Ah! Come on. Now it's here. But the challenge then becomes, is the ratio the same? Because sometimes we grow now and the span is like this of what we know, but our capacity is still like this. And we are not just saved by what we know. We are not just saved. We, we know, we believe, but, but the evidence of our faith is in a lived out faith. Amen? Amen? It's in a lived out faith. We're not saved just because we know facts. We're saved because of the grace of God. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Somebody say amen. 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 That no one should what? Boast or brag? So that you are ready for the good things God has prepared for you to do in advance. It's not just what we know, but it's what we do with what we know. My obedience must match my knowledge. If it's not, it's wholehearted. And this is the challenge because, uh, I mean, story after story of people that are like, man, I loved God, but then they derailed their life. There's a, a famous preacher, famous pastor, uh, years and years ago, he was interviewed, and the interviewer said this. He said, when did you stop loving God? And his response was simply, I, I never stopped loving God but I stopped fearing God. Jesus was my love, but Jesus wasn't my Lord. He knew, he had experienced, he understood so much, his competency was off the charts, but his capacity to live it out was wholehearted. 
And this is what happens. Sometimes we have our, our mind in check. We're, 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 we got our mind in check, but we, we divorce our mind from our emotions. Or maybe our, our mind and our emotions are good, but, but now it's our physical actions that, that sort of, that's kind of my area. And so there's a, in that quadrant of our heart, sometimes that's the wholehearted area. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. Every part of you. In our Western world, we sort of compartmentalize so many things. In the ancient Near Eastern world, none of it was disconnected. It was holistic in its approach. It was the shalom of God, the holistic peace and wholeness of God. Jesus calls it the abundant life because it's not separated. It's not a halfway Herbert moment. It's whole. So I think sometimes the failure to love wholeheartedly may not be a lack of faith, but a lack of fear. It may not be a lack of knowledge, but a lack of obedience to that knowledge. You know, what's amazing is in these instances, these words that follow us for thousands of years throughout Scripture says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. For thousands of years, the people of God had repeated those words. For thousands of years more, we would repeat them. The question then remains, are we wholehearted or are we wholehearted? Are we surrendering our whole life? Or are we reserving a few areas because maybe I'm not ready to give that up because maybe I just don't want to give that up. I don't feel like that's fair to give that up. Wholehearted devotion to Jesus. There are two questions being asked and both had the same answer. One was, how do I get to heaven? And Jesus had the man answer his own question. He said, wholeheartedly love God. That's your your ticket to heaven. The other question was this, what's the greatest commandment? Well, the answer to the greatest commandment is the same answer to how do I get to heaven? And it's loving God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. It's surrendering our life. It's no longer being the leader of my own life, the Lord of mine, but taking me off that throne, placing Jesus right on it. It's honoring who God says he is. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Herbert told a half-truth, but he told a whole lie. This is what his dad said. Jesus doesn't want us to just love him halfway, Herbert. He doesn't want us just to live just half of our hearts. He tells us in the Bible to love God with everything that we have because he deserves our whole heart. Herbert says, but I've never been able to do things all the way. And the wisdom of dad, he says, God knows that none of us can love him all the way by ourselves. So he gave us a friend called the Holy Spirit to help us live out our whole hearts. Dad said, when we decide to follow Jesus all the way, God fills us up. He fills our heart. He helps us obey God. And then Herbert says, well, can God's spirit help me? His dad says, yeah, God loves it when we ask for help. So Herbert prays. And I want this prayer to maybe be your prayer because if you think that a child's prayer is less mature and less necessary than yours, Mm -mm. it is with the heart of a child that we enter into the kingdom. Amen? Amen? So Herbert prayed, Jesus, I'm sorry I haven't obeyed you. I want to follow you, but I don't want to follow you halfway. I need your help. Give me your spirit so I can know how to follow you. And God answered Herbert's prayer. Now he finishes things. He ties both his shoes. He eats his whole lunch. He brushes all of his teeth. He listens to his teachers and his coaches, and he tries to obey what he reads in the Bible. He's not perfect, but God's Spirit helps him. Herbert's never been happier, and no one calls him halfway Herbert anymore. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And maybe this morning, your prayer needs to be that of Herbert's prayer. I know it's silly. I know it's it's a funny way to illustrate a very serious, a very important part of our faith. But our whole heart is what he's after. He's not just after your money. He's not just after you having a perfect resume in front of Jesus. He's after every part of you because in the strength and even in the weaknesses of our lives, that is when God, his glory shows. Amen. 
And that's when He gets all the credit, He gets all the glory, and that's when we experience abundant life. Amen? Amen. So let's not settle for being wholehearted. Let's, let's pursue wholehearted faith. Amen, family? Come on, that's so good. Amen. Woo!